Real Madrid's Champions League magic continues as Los Blancos knocked out City at home to advance to the semi-finals of the Champions League. But was this a stroke of managerial genius from Ancelotti or did they get the rub of the green? Let's examine this, starting with City on the ball as they dominated it. When City were in deeper phases of play, they utilised a more traditional back four, either with Akanji still pushing into the midfield and Edison as the fourth defender or Akanji remaining in this more traditional zone. In these phases, Rodrigo would back up that press, meaning that Madrid's pressing shape could be a lopsided 4-3-3 as Valverde would often look to tuck in. This was highly effective from Madrid, particularly when they were able to stop City playing back infield, primarily through one of the forwards, then looking to pick up Rodri as the deepest man, whilst the other looked to pick up the centre-back, making it difficult for City to find a man. However, committing so many men to the left-hand side also left Madrid vulnerable on the occasions that City were able to find their way in field. They were able to break the press, particularly when City worked the ball round to Vardiol, who would then draw Valverde out of his midfield position. And now, with Rodrigo, Bellingham and Vinicius often still caught high from the press, City could make the most of their 3 versus 2 in the midfield particularly with Rodri getting onto the ball and finally allowing City to move up the pitch almost unchallenged. In more controlled phases of play, City used their now familiar 3-box-3, three three, with the goal being to overload Real Madrid both in the back line as well as the midfield. Ancelotti often doesn't get credit for his tactical setup, but we saw his defensive shape shift from that lopsided 4-3-3 to a much narrower 4-4-2 that could in fact look like a 4-2-4, with the front four operating extremely narrow, which gave them plenty of advantages. The narrow gaps between the front four made playing through these central zones almost impossible, and this was made worse by the fact that both Vinicius and Bellingham could use their cover shadows on that double pivot which is crucial for City to begin the play, whilst also still giving them the ability to continue the press. Whilst the positioning of the forwards freed up Kamavinga and Tony Kroos to track these men in a more man-oriented manner when it was required. Pep had some answers of his own, both down the right-hand side and the left-hand side, both led by his free eight. Down the right, De Bruyne would look to move out wide early on to receive outside this narrow block of Madrid. But as discussed, Kroos would have more freedom to follow his man out wide, meaning De Bruyne would not have time and space. Akanji was given a lot of responsibility in the attacking phase by Pep, as whenever this occurred, it was up to him to move away from his man in Vinicius and into these more attacking midfield positions. And this would leave Tony Kroos with quite the dilemma. If he was to remain narrow on Akanji, then De Bruyne would get that space on the right-hand side that he so craved. But what we more often saw was Kroos being dragged out wide, meaning that Akanji could be found in this region. However, Akanji is a centre-back, so we saw plenty of occasions when he received in potential space, but his body orientation meant he wasn't prepared to turn and attack the Real Madrid goal allowing Real to recover just in time. But whenever he was goal-facing, we saw him be extremely dangerous, as it could be a foot race between De Bruyne and Kroos, as Mendy was dragged wide by Foden, meaning Akanji could look to find De Bruyne in the half space, where he could then look for the cross. And City got into menacing positions like this, but couldn't make it count. Down the left-hand side, Valverde could be much more aggressive in looking to close down his man in Vardio, and whenever this occurred, it created opportunities for City, as Bernardo Silva was extremely mobile, looking for any pockets behind Valverde that he could look to exploit. And while Kamavinga could stay with his man, it also freed up the 1 versus 1 opportunity for Grealish, and in the first half, City looked to find him time and again. This gave City options, as Grealish could go 1 versus 1 against Carvajal, and we often saw him probing in these positions, but he was never quite able to find his preferred back post cross to Haaland. But a dangerous secondary option to this was the half-space run, often by Bernardo Silva, who Grealish would look to find time and again, as he could then look for the cross on his strong foot. 
and City almost got into goal scoring positions like this. These one versus one isolations were occurring with so much frequency, backed up by that half space run, that Doku was brought on as 1v1s are his specialty and Carvajal was on a booking. With Carvajal on a booking, we did see Valverde look to cover deep much more often. But this was not always possible, and the threat of Doku opened up even bigger gaps for City to look to find their men in crossing positions. But also being better at 1v1s meant he could genuinely take on his man. And this even led to City's goal. Real looked dangerous on the transition as ever, because City pushed their back line extremely high to keep the gaps between their defense and midfield, and midfield and forwards, extremely small so that they could easily look to counter-press. The one problem with this is that the threat of Real Madrid on the transition was so much that whenever they got onto the ball, if any of these front three men were running in behind, City would instantly drop deeper and this would create massive gaps between the defense and the midfield. So Real still had the option of hitting their men directly in behind, as the 1v1 pace was still in their favor, or a man in the chasm between the defense and the midfield to then look for the runner, meaning that on a different day, Real would have gotten a goal from the transition. Madrid's game plan meant that they did not have much of the ball, but what do they do when they did have it in controlled possession? Once again, Real's goal was to expose City's high line, and this could be done by directly playing long, as both Bellingham and Valverde are physical enough to, if not to win the ball, at least give their man problems and try to win the second ball. But in open play, the centre-backs would split either side of the goalkeeper, and City looked to force Real to play down one side of the pitch, and this was by having Haaland aggressively mark Nacho. With De Bruyne and Bernardo Silva backing up the press, what this would now mean is that the obvious outlet was to Rudiger. However, Grealish would often occupy this position, ready to both cover Rudiger as well as Carbajal if the ball from the goalkeeper came over the top. However, Grealish wasn't always able to recover in time from picking up Rudiger, and in those scenarios, the responsibility fell on Guardiola to cover the man, and this would spell major danger for City as Real effectively operated with a front two, meaning they could have somewhat of a four versus three advantage with Rodri looking to cover. And as discussed, having many willing runners in behind, as well as willing to show towards the ball, would cause the City backline all sorts of problems. And this led to Real's goal, as we see Guardiola pushing up to press Carvajal, leaving Diaz to cover his man. Bellingham and Vinicius are making runs as always, and Valverde draws in Diaz, giving Bellingham space. Eventually, Valverde is able to keep Diaz out of position, allowing Rodrigo to arrive at the back post to finish. Madrid's Champions League nous shone through, as once again, they never panicked under pressure, both in open play and during the penalty shootout, setting up a clash of the European giants against Bayern. But who do you see going through in that leg? Drop it down below. For the manager tactical score, Pep's plans were for the most part effective, with City dominating the ball and getting chances, with poor finishing letting them down. But Real, as always, looked deadly on the break, meaning that Pep earns a 7.5, while Ancelotti gets a 6.5. But drop your ratings down below.